So I'm seeing a lot of posts lately about people getting meaner. Like, it seems like a lot of y'all have lost your manners. I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like in the past like year or two, um, people have just gotten like so much more shamelessly mean online. Like I made a video where it was just like a second a day and it was a bunch of different like just how I looked that day. So then people were commenting and tagging their friends and just being like, OMG the first one, oh my God, the makeup in the first one, help, OMG. Why is no one talking about the first one? Oh my God. And so I like responded to them and I'm just like, what do you mean? Or like, are you making fun of me? But then they responded and they're just like, no, oh my god, no, you're so pretty. No, I it's just like, I, it looks like 2021 makeup, lol, or like, it's an inside joke with friends. First and foremost, let's narrow this down. Let's make this a little neater as an observation, because over the past thousands of years, people have made this same observation over and over again. A paper for Nature by Adam Mastroianni and Daniel T. Gilbert begins by taking pieces of a quote. Some observers claim that the process of our moral decline began with the sinking of the foundations of morality and proceeded to the final collapse of the whole edifice, which brought us finally to the dark dawning of our modern day, in which we can neither bear our immoralities nor face the remedies needed to cure them. Then the two authors reveal the origin of this quote from 2000 years ago from the historian Levy, who was bemoaning the declining morality of his fellow Roman citizens. The paper argues that such collective observations have always been popular, and yet they're kind of hard to pin down, and often contradictory. For example, some surveys show that people will make this observation a majority of the time while also holding beliefs that racism and sexism are issues that have actually gotten more progressive, that people have gotten more kind about or more open-minded about. One of the hard parts of all this though is what does it mean to be kind, right? There are all types of theories about that, about kindness and ethics and morality. And a lot of the time when people make these assertions, they're basing it off of anecdotal evidence, things they've experienced, which are notoriously hard to base scientific conclusions off of. What I'm noticing when people make this observation mainly is that people are observing it about social media. And that's what I really think we should be talking about. Why is it that it's seemingly so normalized to be rude online to extents that are quite dehumanizing and counterproductive. We'll talk about this, but first, having a public platform always makes me concerned about my public safety. People have the ability now with these really creepy websites to check out where you live. Today's sponsor, Delete Me, offers a useful service. It can help delete your data from the internet by checking around for websites that store your personal information and taking the time to remove it. There are these scummy, low-down, mean people named data brokers who collect personal info from all types of places and then sell it to these greedy websites. If you don't take the time to get that info removed as much as possible, you may be at risk of harassment, identity theft, and stalking. Delete Me can address these issues simply and effectively. The process is quite straightforward. The UX experience is quite good. And I continue to receive reports every few months updating me on what Delete Me's doing. Speaking of updates, Delete Me is constantly updating their product, offering new product releases to help provide customers with better service. That list of those nasty websites I mentioned keeps getting longer and longer, and Delete Me keeps getting longer and longer. They're tracking more and more people doing this stuff. So I encourage you to use Delete Me, and you can use my coupon code SANG for 20% off all US Delete Me packages, including ones that can help your family as well as yourself. Pretty good deal. You can also click the link in the description, join deleteme.com slash S-A-N-G, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. Get straight to it, protect your data, and thank you to Delete Me for sponsoring. So have you ever had the experience of seeing a person, meeting a person, encountering them in real life, and with their physical presence, feeling some type of connection or obligation towards them, even if you don't have a connection toward them emotionally or have talked to them at all, there's a sense of this person is someone who exists and someone who is worthy of some type of respect, worthy of my own ethical responsibility. This is something that Emmanuel Levinas is kind of hinting at or getting at when it comes to his theory about the other and the face-to-face -face interaction. 
with which he finds that ethical responsibility lays its foundation in our philosophical approach to life. It finds its basis in, for Levinas, the sense of corporeality, is that the word? The physical element of being face to face or being in close contact with somebody that that has an effect on us ethically. And this is really interesting when applied to the internet age and the fact that we are supposedly as connected as ever, more connected than ever, and have many varieties of tools with which we can connect with each other. And yet, something about the anonymity, something about speaking behind a username, something about not having to see a person in real life, judge them, based off of either what you visually see or even if it's not something that's in your ability, being able to sort of feel the vibrations of their voice, having a sense of that person's presence and their humanity. Something about losing that on the internet seems to be what motivates people to act in more dehumanizing ways. I don't know if that's true, but that does seem to be how it feels a lot of the time. More than that though, when I really think about why everybody's so mean these days, I have to think about the conditions that make people's lives what they are. Have you heard the phrase, nobody owes you anything anytime recently? How many times? Ola Samvia, a YouTuber who is a friend of the channel, has a video from a few months back in which she discusses this rise of very self-centered self-help advice and the nobody owes you anything phrase, the motto, which is becoming its credo, becoming something that people use to base their own self-help decisions off of. And when I think about sometimes the more oddly inhumane or dehumanizing takes that we see on Twitter and TikTok about how you shouldn't date a person if they don't cover your bill or <laughs> if you are in friendship with somebody and they rely on you to pick them up from the airport, that that's them being a bad friend or people who trauma dump too much or people you should just not talk to or how you should just ghost people if you don't like them anymore. All these different kinds of new conceptions seemingly of how to deal with people that make you uncomfortable. I feel like it goes back to that. It goes back to a sense that we don't owe anybody anything and therefore we've got to do what's in our best interest, what works best for us, even if it imperils other people, even if it makes other people very sad or makes their lives worse in some tangible way. But I think we would be remiss to observe that and not think about the context of why people might be more and more engineered towards ignoring everybody else's humanity and needs. And that is the fact that everybody seems to be fighting harder and harder for their own needs or desires. Everybody is constantly being conditioned to try to get their attention in the place that is beneficial for themselves, to try to move up the career ladder, to try to figure out the perfect work-life balance and engineer their body the right way. And in a lot of cases, everybody's trying to survive or survive easily without having to think about how they're working for their survival. And since the election, of course, we have seen all types of meanness online. It's not a surprise when far right chuds make tweets about how your body is his choice or whatever the fuck. But it's especially jarring to see the kind of switch that a lot of liberals have made in terms of how they express themselves despite how not only rude, but dehumanizing and violence they can come off towards other people. And this is where we have to talk about the post-Trump election liberal reaction from many, but not all at all, um, to shed solidarity with Palestinian resistance, solidarity with Palestinian people, solidarity with other groups of marginalized people in the United States for the purpose of maintaining their own peace. I think a lot of this can be broken down at first in the Levinas other face-to-face -face concept because a lot of y'all talk about marginalized people and people that really exist in the real world as if they are characters in a game with whom you can simply speak flippantly, of whom you can simply disregard. This reaction of people wanting to go back to Starbucks and celebrate it in front of everybody and, and, and shade you know, Arab people because they didn't vote the way that they should have voted is, frankly, it's baffling. Starbucks is a company that has done so much bad for so many people, including being quite anti-union, which is the source of the pro-Palestinian protests of Starbucks in the past year or two, because their stomping out of their union's expression of Palestinian solidarity is what caused them to be lumped into the BDS pro-Palestine protests boycotts in the first place. But it's not as if that 
precludes them from having negative impact on other marginalized people, namely black people. There are definitely incidents in which Starbucks workers have been engineered to be racist towards black customers. And yet you still have certain black content creators. And please mind that I'm speaking about a community that I'm not a part of and I want to be careful about that. But we have certain black content creators who are using even terms from liberation struggle of radical self-care and things of that nature to dispel this notion that they should care at all for Palestinians, that they should care at all for boycotting a brand such as Starbucks, that they should put their comfort and their enjoyment of Starbucks first when it comes to, I don't know, how they engage in the world. Starbucks was union busting their black employees and also have been accused of having black children in West Africa mining for the cocoa, the chocolate that is being used in the Starbucks orders that y'all are drinking now to claim that y'all are going back to caring about only black lives instead of the innocent Palestinian lives. George Bush, the CIA, white supremacy have done a number on y'all to be going and celebrating getting those E. coli infused Ebola burgers from McDonald's is insane. To be posting and bragging about those things, going and, going and getting your breakfast sandwiches and mocha lai lattes from Starbucks is insane behavior. Starbucks is one of the main reasons why a lot of your elders lost their home with many locations that have willfully profiled people who look like you. Y'all think that going back to Starbums and McDonald's is a flex when all along the solidarity of boycotting those on behalf of full esteem was actually benefiting you. And while you presumably think you are going to stick it to the Arab or Muslim point whatever percent of voters that voted for Trump, you have seemingly left out addressing the overwhelming majority of folks who voted for him, which includes white men and white women. Between that or between the jokes slash not jokes of people calling ICE to deport Latinos who they perceive have voted for Trump, it's, it's not giving. Folks have become indoctrinated and infatuated by a concept of self-help that means, writ large, helping the self at the expense of perceived inferior others. And if you ask me, this is what explains the rise of self-help content all over the political spectrum. From your Andrew Tates, to your Hamzas, to your Gary V's, to your West 4B's, to your Wizard Liz's, and the like. Which is not to say that all self-help content is bad or can be compared equally, right? Obviously, the Wizard Liz isn't as bad as Andrew Tate. But I do think much of this content, and let's think about the contents, the messages, rather than just ideas of the people. Much of the content shares that ideological similarity. Put yourself first. Stop caring so much about other people. Stop trying to help other people. Stop trying to fit that mold of what a moral person should do as society has deemed it to you. Instead, take care of yourself. Now, of course, self-help is something that we should care about. Self-care is something we should care about. But what does Starbucks have to do with self-care? Does it really count as a huge sacrifice that we can make in our own lives to boycott a particular corporate coffee brand? Not even all of them. Red pill content, something that we can all agree is bad, right? For those of you who don't, I'm sure you're gonna let me know in the comments. But for the many of us who agree that red pill content is by and large quite bad, we know that this is the case because it celebrates turning people into worse people, turning young men, perceivably, into worse people who care less about women, who care less about the men around them, who have more hateful ideas about what a superior person is, which in itself is quite linked to fascist ideologies. Why are we welcoming of those same logics when it comes to thinking about marginalized people being free, liberation movements, social justice? Moreover, can we really say that this world is so dog-eat-dog -dog that in reality, you do have to take care of yourself first at the expense of others and shouldn't feel bad about it. Is it true that if you simply shut the rest of the world out and put yourself in a cage that you enjoy being in, that this will be better for your mental health in the long run? Is it true that rejection of participating in everyday community and communism is something that is going to make you somehow happier? that by more and more conceiving of the rest of the world and the people around you as isolating and, and dark-sided and wrong, that that's going to make you feel 
more like you belong? That's going to make you feel more fulfilled socially or as a human in general. Does it really feel better to immerse yourself in these niche spaces online where everybody is essentially admitting that they are going to sell each other out down the river to help their bottom line? People who willingly proclaim that a sacrifice of the magnitude of giving up on a particular brand of coffee is so large that they simply will not do it no matter what kind of benefits and morals that entails. A lot of what we've discussed as self-care are really not self-care. What we describe as self-care is actually convenience. Your life isn't meaningfully better because you go to Starbucks instead of a local coffee shop. It isn't meaningfully better because you stopped donating and spent $100 on a massage instead. You're covering up your own melange of self-hate and hopelessness with trinkets and pleasantries, but those things only seem to ease your experience for a few hours at a time. A moment of enjoyment that gets sucked in hours later when you're doom scrolling your FYP and reposting content affirming for the 500th time that you need to put yourself first. Who are you trying to convince? We can all tell you're unhappy. This is ultimately the logic of neoliberalism. It's Margaret Thatcher saying there is no such thing as society, only individual men and women and families. There's no one else to worry about except yourself, and the true hallmark of what it means to be strong is not your moral backbone, your fortitude, your determination in the face of difficulty, but your ability to be self-reliant. And yet, self-reliance is a myth. It's, it's obviously not a thing that really exists, especially for those of us in the West. Everything that we own, everything that we eat, consume, everything that we walk on top of, the houses in which we live, are all constructed by the hands of people who are deeply and, and devilishly exploited. And yet, helping them, those people that build everything that we are self-reliant on, is somehow seen as something that holds us back, that we are being held back just by being asked to do something. Not everything, but just something, let alone the people around us who take care of us in everyday actions. As covered in Clara Mate's The Capital Order, austerity measures are passed by supposedly liberal governments in order to discipline the workforce, to violently push back against people working to benefit their communities so as to encourage them to give up and only focus on themselves. And when they do so, their lives still only get worse and worse. It's not as if the government will give you more and more stuff just because you care less and less. They'll take stuff away from you either way. But you get that false sense of security in your head because you're the only person that you need to worry about, and that makes it easier. If the question is why is everyone so mean now, and we are to disregard the moral panic aspect of such a question, as well as to discard the fact that people have been asking this more and more as state apparatuses have grown more and more over the past thousands of years, the answer at this current moment is austerity and liberalism. Austerity creates the conditions which make us miserable and concerned with our survival, and liberalism gives us the ideology that tells us that only worrying about ourselves in such a landscape is not only expedient, but morally good. And thus, you have these swaths of working class people and immigrants and women across the United States that vote for a party which actively oppresses them on behalf of how they're born, out of the conviction that it will benefit them as the outstanding individual. And that's wrong not only because it's not likely to happen, but because even if it did, it wouldn't be enough. Meanwhile, middle and upper classes celebrate detaching themselves from the everyday communism that makes life bearable and detach themselves from solidarity out of the conviction that it will make their individual lives easier and that such a cause is just as noble as social justice. We can analyze this materially even further by looking at the online spaces that we occupy, which are not neutral places. They're not life. They're corporations owned by far-right people who are trying to exploit people more and more. And on these websites, they set up logics that reinforce this liberal ideology, this idea that simply having the best tweets will get you the best responses. And so no wonder there's such a disconnect between the interactions of everyday life and the interactions of everyday social media, in that there's an attention economy, which incentivizes people to write the most incendiary things to get as much popularity out of it as possible, because we know that engaging people in rage bait and in debate and in inflammatory comments gets a lot more attention than just being chill and nice. And so someone like Anthony Fantano, 
who does seem to have a passion for the arts and espouses leftist ideals quite often, ultimately makes more money by putting a red flannel on and completely shitting on the work of artists whose work is bad enough to dismiss. And we're supposed to think that he's gonna exercise perfect discretion every time that he does that. I never expected to be talking about modern pop singer Halsey on this channel. Again, I am a classic rock critic. I'm not a fan of Halsey. I've made fun of her singing before. And I know Fantano isn't really a fan either. So when I saw this new review in my subscription box, I wasn't expecting it to be positive by any means, but I was well and truly appalled by what I heard. The Great Impersonator is this grand tribute to all of Halsey's icons because Halsey thought she was dying. They've had a terrible last couple years, diagnosed with a rare blood disorder on top of already battling endometriosis. Halsey is very sick. She made the great impersonator to exercise all these demons and to leave her son something to remember her by in the event she succumbed to her illness. Once again, you're allowed to not like Halsey's writing style. I'm not a fan of their music personally but Fantano took it too far. As a music critic, I believe there's some courtesy you have to execute as a writer critiquing someone's life's work. And there's stuff you just don't say, like accusing a person facing their own mortality as having, quote, main character syndrome, or calling these unfathomable crushing fears of leaving your child behind, quote, childish angst. But such a system that rewards such a thing is obviously going to lead to more of that thing, even if it doesn't make any sense outside of that context. And then there's the waffles and pancakes nature of social media discourse in which everyday people are, are trained to think that they are so different from the people that are popular online so as to feel no sense that their ideas can coalesce at all. There's the unwillful or willful interpretation based on the decontextualizing of messages on social media, which not only showcase the problematics of social media as a place for discourse, but also how within these dynamics, the perception of societal meanness is reified. We're taught everybody's mean and then we go out and be meaner. Two people will make points that are not at all incompatible with each other, but have been incentivized to word their takes as snippily as possible because it pays to sound dismissive and have thus alienated each other. This is all consequences of a society that is further filled with atomization, further filled with everyday interactions needing to be squeezed and wrung out for every bit of value that they can get. This is the consequence of a COVID-19 pandemic that is on going but refuses to be treated because we've all decided to accept that some people are just going to have to suffer and it shouldn't come at the expense of our own peace of mind. This is the response to cost of living crises in which it becomes more and more expensive and unbearable to live a morally satisfying life. This is what happens when there are no third places in which people can congregate without having to bring value to the establishment they congregate in. Lily Alexander, who I'm working with on this quick video, made the comments, are we being made to be afraid of each other? And I think we are. I think we need to become the faces with which people have their face-to-face -face interactions again. People need to see each other, to feel each other's physical presence, and to understand the ethical responsibility that we have to each other. Because all of us are here and none of us deserve to be treated as if we don't deserve to be here. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments and uh, subscribe to my Patreon where I interview people like FD Signifier, Lily Alexander, Noah Sampson, and more.